Hello, my name is Franca, and I'm with Turger International. What follows is a very special reading by Helen Dworkoff from her memoir, Lotus Girl, My Life at the Crossroads of Buddhism and America. For those of you who may not know, Helen is the founding editor of Tricycle, the Buddhist Review, the first and only independent Buddhist magazine. She first encountered Buddhism in Asia in the 1960s and has studied in both the Zen and Tibetan traditions. Since 2006, she has been a student of Mingyur Rinpoche and has assisted him in the writing of In Love with the World, A Monk's Journey Through the Bardos of Living and Dying, and Turning Confusion into Clarity, A Guide to the Foundation Practices of Tibetan Buddhism. Please enjoy the reading. Hello, this is Helen Twarkov, and I'm reading from my new memoir called Lotus Girl. In some ways, this is a very personal story, but it's also a story that opens out onto a much larger story of the dissemination of Buddhism into mainstream America. This part that I'm going to read from takes place in approximately 1977. It's the year after I first met Dujum Rinpoche on his either his second or third trip to New York City and takes place in a brownstone on West 16th Street. The year following Dujum's stay on the Upper East Side, John Giorno raised money for a down payment on a townhouse on 16th Street west of Union Square. Yeshi Ningpo Yeshi means wisdom, and Ningpo means heart or essence, would serve as a Dharma center and residence for Dujum Rinpoche, his family, and his retinue. At varying times, this included Sogol Rinpoche, as well as Tukul Pema Wangel, Tukul Tundrup, and Dujum's son from his previous marriage, Tinli Norbu Rinpoche. Over the next few years, I spent a lot of time at the Tibetan center. I had moved into an apartment that my sister and brother-in-law had vacated in the West Village when they relocated to Tribeca, which meant a 15-minute walk to Yeshi Ningpo and a 40-minute walk along the Hudson River to my job with Richard Serra. According to Richard, I arrived at his Tribeca loft every morning after picking up his mail at the Canal Street post office and then routinely tossed it unopened into the trash can. I remember tasks that required a little more finesse. On many mornings, I walked my dog Enoch to Richard's loft on Duane Square, and on many afternoons, I walked north to the Tibetan Center where I often cooked dinner for the family. For meals, Dujan Rinpoche sat at the head of a rectangular table and faced the small windowless kitchen. His wife sat to one side with their family and guests gathered around. I had been a vegetarian, but once I started to fulfill the request for red meat, I began eating leftovers, pot roasts, meatloaves, beef stews, and the more fat, the better. Per the instructions of the person who was overseeing Rinpoche's household, white rice was never exchanged for brown, which steamed itself to sticky perfection in an automatically timed Chinese rice cooker. After serving the meal, I retreated to the kitchen to start cleaning up, but not without peeking out to gauge my efforts and watch Dujan Rinpoche pick up his fork and put down his fork, watch him place his napkin on his lap, see him delight in his daughters. This was my first experience of living Dharma, and it looked nothing like any ideas I had ever entertained about enlightened beings. To watch him was like looking at the sky. A quality of utter transparency prevailed which is not to say that he was explicitly knowable, but that he was without affect. There was no place within his aura to land. Nothing about him engaged me in terms of my own sense of self, 
of who I was or where I was. There was no reaching out to invite you in, as one might expect from conventional encounters. There was nothing to adhere to, nothing sticky, nothing to inquire about, no information that one might use to know another. Wiping his mouth with his napkin or bringing his spoon to his mouth or turning his head toward someone talking was never accompanied by an extra gesture, an eye roll, a raised shrug, a sign of approval. His mind did not appear to follow the movements of his hand. His ears might take in sounds from different directions, but his mind did not appear to race around between the sources of each sound so that, for example, he seemed to just listen without bringing to bear any preconceptions about the source of the sound. Everything about Dujan Rinpoche was utterly natural, but what allowed me to take note of his exceptional behavior was the very absence of what we call ordinary, which turns out to be quite contrived, the way we size each other up, trying to figure out the other by dress, speech, bearing, using projections and biases, trying to understand who we are to the other or who they are to us. Generally, these responses make their way to the surface in the form of tension around the lips or eyes or in gestures, a protruding elbow, a shoulder shrug, a raised brow. Mental activity, supposedly invisible, turns out to be anything but. Dugin's mind did not mask movement, but appeared free of the compulsion to follow thoughts, to constantly move toward or away from sense objects. His eyes might move from one object to another, his ears might move from one sound to another, but his mind did not seem to follow. The photograph of Tuk Quan Duc, who set himself on fire in protest of the South Vietnamese government's crackdown on Buddhists, suggested that his mind had not followed or identified with the sensation of pain. Watching Dujum Rinpoche through the opened crack of the kitchen door felt like falling through space. I could now identify the conceptual mind as the source of suffering, with its propensity to repeat and recycle the same old versions of who we are and where we're stuck, stories that bind and glue through attachment and identification. And I had some faith, more than anything known from experience or information, that the key to liberation lay with the release of these spinning, reiterated stories. But it was still all about my mind. Dujan Rinpoche allowed for an encounter with a big mind, sky-like mind, all-encompassing mind. My mind, Helen's individual small mind, could not comprehend that mind. To meet mine in the embodiment of Dujan, I would have to drop Helen in the embodiment of Helen. I was far from being able to do this, but just being in his presence invited this possibility, and I could intuit how rare a gift this was. Thank you for listening. We hope you've enjoyed this reading from Helen Torkoff on her book, Lotus Girl. If you'd like to learn more about Tibetan Buddhism under the guidance of Mingyur Rinpoche, we highly recommend a subscription to Tergar's Vajrayana Online. The site now features over 20 on-demand courses ranging from the foundational teachings of Tibetan Buddhism to Mahamudra and Dzogchen. Courses regularly feature small groups, live practice sessions, a wonderful community forum, and the ability to schedule interviews with our instructors to gain further clarity or check in on your practice. Visit learning.tergar.org to subscribe or receive a free trial.